wonderful time. I just started the recording and so today we're going to talk about charting a text. You're like, how is the author organizing the text? How do the author start? Why does the author start that way? How does that pull the audience in? But before we do that, I want to go through a few announcements. Um, I'm making adjustments to Canvas still, but those will be done this afternoon. So I think I had you read the prompt for the essay, the rhetorical analysis essay. And since that time, I have moved the deadline for the first draft, which will just be your introduction and two body paragraphs. And it's moved from February 11th, which is a Thursday to Tuesday, February 16th. And I felt like that gave you more time and we wouldn't have to feel rushed. And I hate the feeling of being rushed as an instructor and also as a student. So that just seemed like a win-win for all of us. If you have any questions about the prompt, post those questions on the Q&A section on Canvas, and that way I can answer a question once and it'll probably help other students in the class. The second announcement is the very first Rest and Recovery Day is February 12th, which is very exciting. We don't have class on Fridays Ever. Nothing is ever due that day, but we do have things due on Saturday. And so I felt like in the spirit of rest and recovery days that we should not have homework due on February 13. So there you go. You have your first holiday of holiday. Um, the group project module is open. I'm still making a few adjustments. Um, thank you, Emily. I know that's why I put the little dancing people on the as the icon. The group project module is open. I'll talk more about the groups. Um, if you have questions, again, post those in the Q&A section. This Wednesday, we're not meeting as a full class. We're going to meet in reading groups. So if your reading group is when, if you're reading Cannon Fodder, um, you'll meet from 11 to 11.15. If you're reading Hip Hop Planet by James McBride, you'll meet from 11.15 to 11.30. And if you're reading Gloria Anseldua and How to Tame a Wild Tongue, you'll meet from 11.30 to 11.45. For the asynchronous students that are doing Bronson Koenig's What I Found in Standing Rock, I will make an asynchronous video talking about some things that I think it's important to see. Um, and that brings um, me to, I'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, you're going to be annotating in groups. Um, so don't hesitate to use the discussion board. Um, your very first annotation, let it just be about how the story makes you feel. Because these personal essays are really profound. Um, think about the argument, you know, like what is it that the author wants the primary audience to think or believe after reading this? Um, let the story do its work instead of trying to, you know, like dissect it into rhetorical strategies and, and you know, like just let the story be a story because that's how somebody would read it otherwise. Um, keep in mind, you're probably not the primary audience for this text. I mean, you might be, but probably not. Um, still, it's okay to think about the emotions that you feel when you read certain parts of the text and just note those as you're annotating. Um, and later on, you can think about, you know, like why you feel those emotions. So I wanna talk about the writing center. And you've all read Ben Rafeth and his reasons to go to a writing center. Um, it's basically, he argues that, you know, like the writing center isn't just for people who are in trouble, but all students can benefit in many, many ways by visiting the writing center and by the conversations 
that they have with tutors. Um, I'll talk about the module in just a little bit, but here is where I stop share and I let Sarah talk. Um, Sarah, can you let us know, you know, like what is a writing center session like? I mean, behind me, we see all these people, um, you know, like meeting one by one, working at tables. Um, it's not exactly like that, but tell me what happens or tell the group what happens in a writing center session. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty casual. Um, we're we're we try to be pretty pretty laid back here in the writing center. Um, all of us who are tutors are students ourselves. Um, you know, some of us are undergraduates, some are graduate students. But at the end of the day, we're all students. Um, and so, what we're trying to do at the end of the day um, is to facilitate conversation over your work. Um, so this is not us telling you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. It's asking questions. Um, it's sort of provoking you to think about your work the way you want to. Um, and, uh, you know, you can bring any questions that you have for us and, and we'll do our best to kind of, um, we're, we're there as sounding boards for you. Um, so, you know, more, more than anything. Um, and um, I, I actually really like kind of what Aaron said about the fact that, uh, you know, it's, it's really not just about the fact that, um, People come to the writing center looking for grammatical help or sentence structure work and that kind of thing. And, and we're totally fine with helping people do that too. But I've also had other tutors sign up for my tutoring session because we wanna help each other out on the papers that we're working on. So it really is kind of for all levels. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's not just um, exclusive to a certain group of people. We'd like to see as many different kinds of writers in the writing center as we can. What kind of papers do students come in with? What kind of writing assignments do they come in with? We get all sorts. Um, so we have, you know, as you would expect, we get plenty of people who are in writing classes, RWS classes, but we get every discipline possible. And sometimes we get writing uh, samples that are not from any particular discipline. <laughs> we get applications, we get personal statements. Um, as long as a student is enrolled at SDSU as a student, they're welcome to use the Writing Center as a resource. And what kinds of things do they ask for help on? Yeah, I mean, all sorts. Uh, you know, the the sort of, I think, again, kind of the more typical understanding of the Writing Center is that people come and ask for proofreading. Um, and while we certainly get, you know, students who are looking for that kind of sentence by sentence um, editing, uh, you know, sometimes we have people who come in with just the prompt and maybe a few sentences written down and are like, ah, we, I just, I don't really know where to go from here. And then we just kind of function as like, okay, let's start brainstorming and building this sort of uh, the basic blocks of what your essay is going to look like. Um, so, you know, really, I mean, we, we get students asking for help on, you know, style, uh, on, on grammar, on structure, on organization. Sometimes we have students who come and saying, I don't even know what questions to ask, and we go from there. Thanks, Sarah. Is there, um, is there anything else you can think that maybe students might want to know about the Writing Center? Um, I think, um, I don't know, there's a lot of good things. Um, <laughs> I think one thing that's really useful is um, the the versatility in which we can kind of work with you all and, and respond to you all. Um, ideally, we sort of have this, um, you know, we, we have your text in front of us uh, and we talk over video and we talk over, over audio, um, but you can also uh, submit things. You can turn off your camera and video uh, and audio. If you're not comfortable with that, you can talk with us just over chat. Um, you can do e-tutoring where if you don't have consistent internet access, you can submit your paper that way, get a few comments back, that sort of thing. So I think that's also uh, really useful, especially during the pandemic. Uh, do any of you have questions for Sarah? Um, remember, you can, um, if you want, you can just um, unmute yourself and ask, or you can ask in the chat. Where do we go on the website, like on the SDSU website to like find the writing center so we can set up like a Zoom with you guys? 
Good question. Um, let me see. Erin, actually, you're probably better equipped to answer this than I am. <laughs> um, let, me, um, let, uh, let me share screen and I can show you. Um, let me get out of the slide deck. And so here is our website. I've been working in the Writing Center for about four years now, and I never, never know. I, I just don't ever remember the URL for the Writing Center. So I just Google it. So this is our website that you see right now, and there's information about about us you can see meet our tutors and and you'll see pictures of all our tutors and what their backgrounds are oh that's jessica not janae that's interesting and that is not jessica okay well this is exciting i will send a note today but good thing i know this now so if you want to make an appointment if you want to find out um about um, are different types of appointments. Go to click on online and e-tutoring appointments and then click on make an appointment and you will log in and you will see this. It won't look exactly like this because I have administrator privileges and um, so I have different colors. You'll just see blue and white and another color of blue. So any of the white boxes are appointments that you can make. And if I click on one of those, this is, um, I don't think you're gonna, I don't think you're seeing that. You are not. So um, this is how you would make an appointment. You'd click on a white box and fill in the kinds of things that you're working on. I'm gonna do this um, writing for a class, uh, biology and what you want to work on um, grammar and when is your assignment due yesterday and and then you click on a create appointment and immediately that appointment will turn sorry let me go back here it turns yellow which is what would happen to you. And then when you click on that, new share, sorry. You'll see start or join online consultation. You click on that when it's time for your appointment and you'll get taken into a slot that looks like this. And um, that will allow you to upload your paper. Does that make sense? Emma, okay, oh, I'm sorry, that was you, Sammy. Yeah, thank you. Um, other questions that you have for Sarah? Sarah, what's your major? Uh, I'm a studio major. Yeah, we have we have tutors that are from a variety of backgrounds, and not just RWS or English or journalism. Um, we have accounting, we have finance, we have um, some sciences, some kinesiology. For some reason, we have a lot of psych majors in our pro, in our tutoring session. Not really sure what that is. We have more psych majors than RWS or English majors. But there you go. So, um, so you can make an appointment with Sarah, who you have now met, or any of the tutors. And uh, feel free to do so, and I'll get the names fixed. Sarah, anything final you want to add? Um, I just hope to see some of you guys out there. It'd be nice to, to meet some of you uh, virtually. OK. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye bye.
let me get back to what we're doing. Um, uh, sorry, the, the little, um, So on the homepage, you'll see a writing center module and there is a link for earning extra credit for registering and writing about the experience. Some of you are already registered. And so just go on to that assignment link and say, hey, I've already registered and I've never been to the writing center or I've been before or whatever, just answer the question there. This class is focused on the tutoring of writing, and so you're required to visit the Writing Center twice this February and write about um, your experience. Um, some things that you could visit the Writing Center on, I mean, you can visit the Writing Center for a class that's not this one, um, but you're going to be doing a group presentation, creating your own slide deck, so you might wanna go based on that. Um, you might also want to visit the Writing Center to get feedback on your essay at any point in the process. Um, yeah, anything. And after that, you know, like in March, April, and May, you can earn extra credit. So that means that there are, yeah, 35 extra credit points based on the Writing Center. And then so take advantage of that. Any questions about the Writing Center before we move on? Okay, I want to do a quick review on rhetoric. Rhetoric is, and this is a bunch of quotes. Um, you've probably heard the ability to determine the available means of persuasion, that's Aristotle. The ability to move the soul with words, that's Plato. But more current, more recent, Douglas Enninger says rhetoric is the discipline that studies the ways which men may influence each other's thinking and behavior through the use of strategic symbols. And those symbols could be words or images. And Enninger was writing in a previous time where they talked about men, but we really mean people. Um, Lloyd Bitzer says, it's a mode of altering reality. It's changing the way people view the world. And that's what rhetoric is about. It's about changing the way somebody views the world. And if you can change the way they view the world, you are creating an argument. An argument is about helping an audience see an issue in a new way. I mean, it might be X is good because blank or it's bad because blank or we should do this thing because, or we shouldn't do that thing or this is true and we know it because, I mean, like these are arguments. Basically everything is an argument. If, if I post an image and I want you to think about certain things based on that image, that's an argument that you should think about that. Or if I want you to have a positive response to something, that's an argument. And so arguments are woven into nonfiction, definitely, but even into fiction. The texts that we're reading right now are creative nonfiction. And so when we read Kelly Linfor, she's arguing that teachers need to prevent present literacy education in a way that values all literacies, not just the ones that are confined in the classroom, and that we should value the way people learn multiple literacies. And quite honestly, her argument, which is for me less so than you, as she was writing to literacy educators, and I fall into that category, but her argument haunted me over time. And the more I taught it, the more I was, I, I was compelled to change the way I taught. 
and this has been an evolution. And so arguments are designed to do something. Um, so we've got this idea of arguments and then we have rhetorical strategies and what fits them together. Rhetorical strategies make the text more engaging for the audience. And because the audience is more engaged in a very specific way, um, with Callie Lynn for it's definitely shock value, um, sadness, horror, curiosity. The more engaged I was, the more I began to see her point of view related to literacies. And so because I was engaged in the way she intended me to be engaged, she was more persuasive. So, so the rhetorical strategies are, aren't just there to make the text more interesting, although they do that, but they're designed to make it more persuasive. And by the way, persuasion isn't just about you know, like getting the audience to know something or to understand something. It's about getting them to um, experience emotions and you know, like begin to trust the author um, or to say, oh, that makes sense. That's logical. Um, and so it's very, those rhetorical strategies have a purpose, which is to get the audience to respond. And so when you're analyzing a text, a rhetorical analysis, you're thinking not just identifying that strategy and providing the example and talking about how it makes the text, the author see something or know something, it's about response. And so you're connecting the strategies with the claims and how they're organized, how they build upon each other. And it's like building a puzzle. And this organization helps the author build the argument. So the author thinks, let me start this way so the audience will respond this way. Questions? Sometimes, um, and I know that in a few of your um, reflections, you said, I'm having a hard time finding rhetorical strategies. There are so many rhetorical strategies. There are rhetorical strategies that I do not know the names of. Um, the ones that I focus most on and what it might be easier for you to focus on in order to identify them are the things that I can best analyze with the audience in mind. So if something is a description, uh, and there are lots of names for description, Latin names for descriptions, fancy four syllable words. But if I call it a description I, and I focus on the audience's response, that's most important or comparing one thing to another, it allows me to think about how will that comparison impact the audience? And so it's, it's never just about the strategy, it's about the impact of the audience. And so when you're looking to analyze strategies in an essay, you wanna think about like, what are the strategies that, um, I can best analyze with the audience in mind. And I always recommend that you think about the opening strategy because the way an author starts a text is really, really valuable. The author is setting a tone. Um, and then what comes next and comes next and comes next is all about building that argument. It's sort of like building a puzzle. So. We're gonna look at Callie Linfor one more time. And then it, it is, as you have options for this essay. You can analyze Callie Linfor if that's the essay you wanna analyze in your rhetorical analysis. Um, or you could do the text your, your reading group is working on, or you can choose another text. So there are a total of five texts available to you to analyze. So let's talk about charting. Charting is focusing on what an author is doing. 
um, what is the title doing? How does the author start? Um, what's the impact on the primary audience? Um, what, what is the author doing? What is the author doing? And so it's looking at that. Um, it's also about rhetorical strategies, but it's, it's really more than that. Let me show you um, on Canvas. Uh, okay, let me change this to student view. And I will go to the module for this week. And this is charting Lin4 on Canvas. I'm gonna put you in groups in just a minute and I'm gonna ask you to continue. So I started charting from the beginning, just as an example. And I started with the title. And so I'm just labeling this charting and then analysis. And obviously this is a weird title, Joyous Survival, The Literacy of the Hillside Strangler. And it's a confusing title with cognitive dissonance. And I just put some analysis. It's like, how can the Hillside Strangler have a literacy? The strangler kills, how is their survival? What is the anything extra we know? And it's just breaking it down. The next thing I highlighted is the first sentence of the first paragraph. You know, like how Kelly starts. And I'm just saying, I'm gonna have one sentence description of what she's doing in this paragraph. Lin Four establishes a time for her story and the setting. And that's what she's doing in this paragraph. Having a setting is really important in a text. We know that this is happening in 1977. We know it's happening, um, that there are some murders going on. And if we read the title, which we should always read a title, we can suspect it's the Hillside Strangler, even though the author doesn't say that in this first paragraph. And so this is all about setting the stage. And I just put some rhetorical strategies there, visual description uh, that includes comparison and metaphor, evoking the imagination and emotions of the audience. And then the next paragraph, um, the author is, and through the end of the page, Lin Four continues setting the scene, but now she describes how she experiences the time period. So it's just like, what is she doing? And then the rhetorical strategies. In fact, this whole paragraph is her setting the scene, setting the stage. Um, down here again, um, she's describing herself and how she views the news reports. I mean, it's it's sort of creepy. And now she adds her mother into this. So those are, those are my charts for organizing. So it isn't what we were doing before, but something new. Questions? What I want to do is I want to put you in breakout rooms, but I want to put you in the breakout rooms that are your um, I want to put the breakout rooms that are your reading groups. So Emily, Hannah, Alex, and Elia. you'll all be in that room. Um, add a room. Um, Maylee, Emma, Avery, 
And Joseph isn't here. Um, and then Sammy, Riley, and Kiana, you're all in these rooms. What are you going to be doing in those rooms? Um, room one, if you could chart um, where I left off and the next full page, okay? And then room two, um, so that would be two and three. Um, room two, if you would do page four and page five. And room three, if you could do page six and page seven, okay? You'll need to log into Canvas in order to do this. Okay, questions about what you're doing? I'm not gonna give you a lot of time. I just wanna talk about it briefly as you do that, okay? So I'm gonna open the rooms and you're good. I think everybody's back now. Um, I want to just take a look at some of your annotations. Oops, I think I'm going to need to. Oops. I'm not authorized to view that page, of course not. Sorry about this. So I just wanted to take a look. Oh, you can't see any of this. I am so sorry. This is not the most smooth way to do things, but we're all on the same page now. Thank you. Um, so here we are on hypothesis, and um, and I like what we're doing here. Um, and all of this is really collaborative, and it helps you. Um, Elio wrote, uh, "Lynn for transitions from talking to the media to her mother telling about her shoes," and. Um, it's a transition to a new setting and which is the most important thing. So we go from this idea of, it's that transition from in front of the television to a memory, a story that her mother starts saying. And Elia named a lot of really good strategies, super visual. We could also call this narrative um, it's very, very emotional, and it would probably evoke, you know, like, yeah, anger, fear, um, just depending. Um, Hannah went, um, there's, uh, talked about what she's doing. She uses short, abrupt sentences that escalate the drama. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have, Hannah, great job naming a strategy. I don't know if this is in any list of strategies, but it doesn't matter. This is a good name for a strategy. Truncated sentencing. He said nothing, she said nothing. Her tongue too busy with tasting blood, she told me. Oh gosh. Um, Emily uh, uses simile, um, repetition. Um, it's good to name the strategies we also want to talk about what the author's doing. Why does that matter? Is when you're setting up a strategy, creating context for a strategy, when you are creating context for a quote, talking about what an author is doing is super, super valuable. 
So Sammy has, um, she's walking home from the library. And I think, you know, like that is definitely um, good, but it's also, she changes the setting in order to guide readers to a new narrative. So it's, that's more focused on what she's doing. And um, yeah, Sammy, great description. Um, she, and another good point is she ties back to the title. Very, very important. Nice, nice work, all of you. Um, I want to put you back in your groups one more time. We don't have a lot of time, five minutes. You are in the groups with the people that you're going to be working on. And whenever you're working in a group, you want to establish some important things for your group work. And um, specifically, you want to talk about, you know, like, how are you going to communicate with each other? In my plan is that when we have class on Wednesday, we'll gather together and we'll start talking about the text together. You can continue talking afterwards. If your group wants to log in and um, at the start of the class and go into a breakout room that you can just have a conversation about the text, that's good. Um, but you wanna establish some guidelines. How are you gonna communicate with each other? How often are you gonna communicate with each other? What are each of you going to do? And obviously you haven't read the prompt yet um, for the group projects. And that's okay, um, but I want to put you in your group so you can just have some preliminary conversations. When you're done with your group, um, you can just leave. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to stay on there all the way till 11.59, at which time I have to close the Zoom because I have to open it up for another meeting. So thank you all of you for your great participation and good, good job charting. Okay, um, I'm out. Oh no, I'm putting you in breakout rooms. Yeah, there you go.